methods development unit and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to the September ACEC Civil 3D user group meeting. Our topic today is going to be intersection design development. Um, Brian Lewandowski out of CTC in the Twin Cities is going to be doing the live demonstration port of our, portion of our meeting today. And before I turn things over to Brian, I'd just like to provide you guys with a status update on civil 3D development and training development at Wisconsin DOT. <clears throat> and the third topic, I guess, for status update is going to be our design model implementation. We implemented our standards for content requirements regarding design model this summer. We published the FDM requirements um, associated with design model in the June FDM transmittal. The requirements are more or less intertwined with our civil 3D project delivery requirements that were published in the March transmittal, March 2014 transmittal. You're going to find the content associated with this in the FDM in chapters 15 and chapters 19. That's plans production and PS&E preparation. The effective date for our design model requirements is July 2014. The way we implemented it, the intentions are for it to only impact new project work starting up. The details of those requirements are in the FDM. But it's important to know that projects, designs that were already underway should not be impacted by these requirements. One more thing I'd like to mention about design model implementation is we worked with ACEC over the past year to identify extra work associated with developing design models, figuring out how that's going to impact the design process. We've developed quite a bit of information with the group that we put together that we're partnering with ACEC on and we have a finished report that's going to be published I think within the next two or three weeks. We've been working with ACEC, we got some final comments on it this week and we're going to do some report touch up. So you can be looking for that soon. That's going to help everybody get a better understanding of how these new design deliverables are going to affect the amount of effort on design projects. Other up, up other update items today, um, we have a uh, Civil 3D Standard Edition for TPP plat sheets. The, there is le new legislation in place that's going into effect or may already be in effect. I'm not sure what the situation is, but I know it's already been um, passed. And that requires something to do with RLS stamping. We have the standards on the title sheet for TPP plats to support the new legislation. So if you have questions on that, you can contact our DOT CAE support inbox and we'll help you find it. New civil 3D training that uh, will be released, I think, within the next month. Uh, we have introduction to pipe networks with our rollout of civil 3D 2014. We put out our part catalog for pipe networks and now we have some training associated with building pipe networks in your data. Uh, culvert design, talking about you know the hydrology associated with culvert design. Storm sewer layout using pipe networks and then plan and profile sheet creation with storm sewers that are being represented for pipe network by pipe networks. So you can look for that new training content coming out within the next month or so. Um, one final item to mention, uh, we implemented Civil 3D 2014 into our production environment earlier this year. It was uh, back in March, I believe we released it. And <clears throat> this was our second version migration uh, since we started using Civil 3D at the department. We started in 2010, we used 2012, so we had a migration there and now we're into 2014. Um, the, the effort to migrate projects from 2012 to 14 is more substantial than our first time around. And what we've learned through the summer helping people migrate their project data, we want to share that. So we're developing guidance on project data migration. That information is going to be released soon also. We're putting the final touches on that and that's just about ready to go. 
So if you haven't migrated your project data yet, and I know many people already have, but if you haven't, you can look forward to seeing that. If you have, you know, I'm sorry that we didn't get this guidance out sooner, but this is really what we learned helping you guys do these migrations, and we want to share it. And um, it will be, of course, in place, these, this guidance for the next time around when we go from 2014 to whatever our next production version is going to be. And it's not going to be 2015, I should mention. We've made that decision. So with that, thank you for bearing with my status update. And I'm going to turn things over to Brian Lewandowski in Eau Claire. Thanks, Brad. And hello, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, the, the topic today then is the Civil 3D User Group event and its corridors and intersection modeling. Uh, just a little bit about myself, who I am. Um, Brian Lewandowski, I work for um, CAD Technology Center out of Minneapolis. Um, I'm the infrastructure industry manager there and also an application engineer. I do all sorts of training and, and consulting for different firms and organizations. Um, as it relates to civil 3D or other civil engineering um, and surveying software under the, the Autodesk umbrella, I should say. Um, I get involved in many different ways doing speak, uh, presentations like this. Um, at CTC, we do all sorts of things. We've got a lot of free webinars, this same kind of thing that we do. And one thing we're, uh, we're all excited about coming up is an event we call Midwest University. It's uh, coming up in in uh, March of next year. It's a two-day conference with um, over 50 technical classes dedicated to both the civil engineering and architecture industry. So it's our annual conference. We're pretty excited about it. We have people come from all different areas uh, to that event. So we encourage you guys to check that out on our website. So just a couple other logistics. We always encourage any of those remote participants um, that the live sessions are great because we have Q&A afterwards. Uh, so you can talk to those power users at any one of those locations um, and, and really have some nice interaction with them. Um, the data set I'm going to be using today and a video of the presentation will be available afterwards. So, so don't worry about taking too many notes or anything like that. Um, there is the link for it. Um, we'll make it available in other ways as well. So with that, we'll jump right into it. I've got just a couple slides before we go into Civil 3D. Um, but I just want to outline a little bit what we're talking about here. So the focus is on corridor modeling today. So we're not spending detailed time on how do you make an alignment, how do you make a profile, um, that sort of thing. It's about intermediate to more advanced corridor modeling. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at a, a WSTA B1 intersection, a T intersection, modeling roughly the, the piece you see on the screen there. And we're going to do all this in one corridor, but we're going to be using multiple baselines. Um, obviously, at least two baselines, one for the side road, one for the through road. Um, we're going to use all sorts of different targeting techniques. Um, for those of you who have maybe, if you haven't got into targeting with corridors yet, that's kind of where all the power is. That's how you handle anything that's varying or changing in your corridor. So we'll, we'll be doing a lot of that as well. Um, we have some super elevation applied on this through a road. I won't spend a lot of time on the super elevation wizard itself, but I will point it out. Um, and I just wanted to throw it in there to kind of introduce another complexity into this intersection. And we'll also talk about uh, what we call setup corridors. Um, and this is a kind of secondary corridor that allows us to create um, dynamically linked profiles for things like the edge of the travel way. So I'll talk about what that is in some more detail. Um, we certainly will use alignments and profiles and surfaces and assemblies, but like I said, we won't talk in detail about how to use those. So, so it is it is a more kind of an intermediate, advanced level um, um, webinar or presentation. So diving into it a little bit more, um, we're going to be building seven different corridor regions to model this intersection. Um, and we're actually going to do in the order that you see there. We're going to start on the left side there uh, where the number one is. And that's basically a full uh, section there where a turn lane starts opening out. Um, and then section two on the opposite side, that's 
that's pretty similar. We've got the taper coming off of the, uh, the, the side road there, but it's a full road section that has shoulders and, and ditches and such on both sides. Um, the third region will basically be a full road section, but we'll cut off the shoulder and the ditch on the one side there. So that'll, that region will just be modeled by, along that edge of travel way there of the, of the main road. And then a full road region for uh, region four. That'll be the side road there. And we'll address some tapering and, and widening and such in there as well, um, using targeting and a number of other strategies. Um, and then we have three other regions where it gets a little trickier. Um, five is basically a half road section of the side road. And then six and seven are curb return regions. Okay, so we're going to be using. Uh, different assemblies for virtually all of those um, to model different portions of this. So we're not using the intersection wizard. We're building these regions manually. Um, and frankly, in an intersection like this, uh, I believe it's, it's easier and, and creates a more dynamic model when you do this manually instead of trying to use the intersection wizard. Uh, the wizard works great, I, in my opinion, with kind of smaller residential, fairly simple intersections. Um, it's kind of a horse apiece when it becomes a little more complex like this. So uh, we've got workflows, I know, in some of the videos online uh, showing it both ways, uh, but I'm going to do the one without the wizard today. So let me jump into Civil 3D, just explain the data that I have here. So I've got three drawings open here. The first one is just my existing topo. It's just a surface in there fairly simple surface. My second one here, this is my alignments and my profiles drawing. And I've got some alignments and profiles established already. Uh, the third one is my corridor drawing. And this is where we're going to be doing the majority of the work. So this first one, the existing surface, that is data referenced or data shortcutted into my second drawing. So we're not going to actually do any work in here. So I'm going to close out of here at this point. And then in the second drawing, like I said, I have data shortcutted or data referenced in the existing surface into this drawing. So that allows me to cut profiles and such. So if we take a look at this a little bit, I have drawn up the, the key geometry of this intersection. Okay. So the heavy green lines are the center line alignments. Got all these alignments drawn up. Okay. And we've got another a number of other alignments. Now, I would have liked to have shown you how to kind of create all this stuff, but like I said, I'm trying to fit it into 40 minutes here, and I want to show really just the key features of putting this corridor together. So uh, we will be skipping over some of this, this alignment creation stuff. So all of these right now, like I said, are just alignments. Um, I've got alignments on both sides for the edge of the travel way. That's just 12 feet off of center line. I have an alignment here as well represent representing the edge of the turn lane, the edge of the pavement right here. Okay, That's another alignment drawn in. I have the edge of the paved shoulder, Okay, and it's all drawn to the specs in that B1 uh, technical document. And then I have the edge of the unpaved shoulder right here. And what you'll notice, of course, is that this really varies when we go into where the transition is for the turn lane. That varies. How do we handle that? Okay. Similar situation on this side of the intersection, the east side. In the side road, we have a, a taper or a widening as it comes up to the intersection. And then we have two curb returns. So these purple alignments here, these are alignments as well. These represent the flange of the curb or the edge of the pavement. Okay. So this is how we want to draw up our alignments. Uh, some of these minor things, these, these tapers right here, that's, again, following the spec um, for a B1 intersection. I have profiles drawn for the center line of both the main road. We're calling it uh, fictitious Highway 8. And then I have a profile drawn for the side road. Okay. So again, skipping over some of that, getting right to the good stuff, the corridor modeling. So all these alignments then, these are da then data shortcutted or data referenced into my corridor drawing. 
So we're seeing nearly the same thing here. And I've got two viewports here. So I've got an assembly that we're going to use on the bottom. And then I have alignments that are data shortcutted in on the top. And so I'm going to be kind of be going back and forth between these two viewports explaining um, how we're assigning targets to different sub-assemblies in that overall assembly. So like I said, we're going to start with the region over here. Okay. And we're going to create a corridor. We're going to model one region from way out here where it's just typical right up to where this curve returns. So we're going to handle that with one assembly using multiple targets and a number of other tricks as well. So I'm going to come up here and create corridor. We'll call this 8 dash Westwood. So that's Highway 8 and the side road is Westwood. We've got alignment, Highway 8. The profile is the proposed profile. And the assembly is the one we see right down here. It's a fairly typical uh, section right now. Two lane pieces, a shoulder, and then the daylighting subassembly on the side. I'm going to pick that one as well. My target surface will be that existing surface that we saw on the first drawing. That is data referenced into here as well. I'm going to leave on set baseline and region parameters because I want to come into the next window and specify some of my station limits. It defaults to the full length of the alignment. I want to shorten that region right here. So I'm going to pick this icon. And initially, we're going to stop short of even where the turn line is. Okay, So this is a nice way to handle um, station limits of your region. And from here, we're going to take the defaults from then on. Okay. So I've got a couple things to, to do to this region. I have to modify this. Um, I've got some typical and default widths assigned in these sub-assemblies. Um, but it's always a good practice to manage those widths with, um, with targets. So the edge of the travel way, more importantly, this turn lane, uh, the edge of the shoulder and such. So right now on the right side, I see this shoulder. I see a two-foot paved shoulder there. Um, this is the alignment that is to govern the width of that shoulder. Okay? So I need to set that target. This alignment right here is the edge of the gravel shoulder. Okay, I need to set that to govern that width right there. Okay, So right now, this point out here, ES unpaved, is this line right here. And the styles are set up pretty nicely. Basically, we want to line up this dash red line with that dash red line. So let's assign some targets here. 2014, uh, it's a lot nicer interface for editing. I'm a big fan of this contextual ribbon. We're going to pick on Edit Targets, and then it prompts us for a region. So we hover over the corridor, highlights a blue, we click that, and it brings us into target mapping for just that one region. This is pretty handy um, to me when you start getting 10, 20 regions in your corridor to use that instead of going into corridor properties is, is really pretty streamlined. So what we're looking at here is setting targets to govern the shoulder width. Okay, Paved shoulder width right here. This is the, the parameter or the value that governs that paved shoulder width. The total top shoulder width is what governs the, the gravel shoulder width. Okay, Some of this terminology, you're not going to be able to memorize it all. Okay. You try them out, you'll get used to these sub-assemblies. You'll start to learn what this terminology is and what target governs what piece of the sub-assembly. So I'm going to pick on this paved shoulder. I'm going to go in here to None. And I'm going to pick the green box to go out and select an alignment. And I'm going to pick this paved shoulder alignment. And the other thing I'm going to do here, and I'll explain in more detail, is I'm going to pick the paved shoulder alignment on the east side of the intersection, too. Like I said, I'll explain more, but the reason we're doing that is because we're trying to mimic a region definition that we'll be able to use on both sides of this intersection. So hit enter, and I hit add, and I get two alignments there representing my edge of paved shoulder. Hit OK. Now we're looking at the edge of the gravel shoulder, and that's this total top shoulder width. I pick in there where it says none. I pick the green checkbox, and I go out and pick this alignment. 
as well as the one on the other side of the intersection. Okay. Hit enter, hit add, and both of those alignments come in there. And hit OK. And I should now see, if I zoom in here, I'll see that edge of gravel shoulder matching up there, and this one matching up with the edge of paved shoulder. Okay. So this is what we're going to be doing a lot of, targeting a number of these different alignments to govern these widths. And what about when I bring this corridor, I can pick on this and I can drag this up here, I have a grip on it. What about when I bring it up to where the turn line is? Now I mentioned there's super elevation on this alignment. This alignment becomes, or this, the through roll becomes super elevated through here and it goes to a 4% cross slope. The turn line is still going to stay at the 2% cross slope. That means we need two sub-assemblies in there. We've got one right here that will manage the through line. We need another one to manage the turn line. But how do we do this so it works all in one region and all in one assembly? Well, there's a nice little trick here. We've got to put another lane in here. So I'm going to come down here and do a copy to. So these are common sub-assembly commands. Do a copy to and attach this, make a copy of it right to itself. Okay. And then I'm going to grab the shoulder and the daylight sub-assembly and do a move to and put that out there. Okay. So that's going to be my turn lane. This is going to be my through line. Now here's a little trick. If we're outside of this turn lane, we're down here and it's a typical uh, section, but then up here it needs to start opening up. How do we do this? Okay. Some of you might be familiar with this. You take this lane subassembly, you go to the properties of it, and we set it to an insignificant width, 0.01. Okay, so now I have a tiny little subassembly right here, just a hundredth wide. Okay, you can even go smaller if you want, go a thousandth wide. This subassembly is going to target this alignment over here, such that when the region comes into here, that small one hundredth width wide subassembly will basically open up and govern that um, that turn line couple other settings we have to look at as well. This small turn line, or excuse me, this small lane subassembly. This one we don't want to follow super elevation defined in the alignment. So we've got to come in here and we say don't use the outside lane super elevation, instead use fixed. This will then just use the standard negative 2%. We'll do the same for the subgrade super elevation method, except that we'll say follow pavement. So whatever slope I set that to, the subgrade slope will go to that as well. Because we're not wanting the turn lane to be super elevated through this, just the through lanes. Okay. Now one of the things you start moving and copying subassemblies around like that, you'll lose your targets. Okay, so those targets we just set, they're actually going to be lost now. So I'll go in a little bit more quickly and set those again. So again, edit targets, pick on this guy. I'm going to go through and set these a little bit more quickly now. This is the paved shoulder. It's that alignment. It's also that one. Click add. Edge of the gravel shoulder is that alignment. And also with this one. Click add. Okay. And then the new subassembly I have in here is the second lane generic on the right side here. I probably should have taken the time and renamed it and called it turn lane or something, but I know it, that it's the second one in the list. That's that little hundredth width wide one. I need to come in here and assign alignment for that too. That's this edge of turn lane pavement alignment. So I'm assigning that one, and I'm also picking this one, because this is basically the same scenario here. It's a widening of the turn lane. It, it opens up here and then it gets wider. Okay, so the definition of this region is the same on both sides. Hit OK. Hit OK to that target assignment. And now I can see that small lane piece. That's this little one right here. That's now widening in there. My paved shoulder and my gravel shoulder is following that. So now if I pick this, and I drag this all the way up to my curb return region, 
right there, I'm going to see that turn lane opening up. In fact, let's jump into section editor and just make a quick verification. Let's go to this region down here. As I click next through this, I'm going to see my road start to super elevate, but it won't be the turn line, right? So we're seeing 4% there, but still 2% in the turn line. We also see our paved shoulder width varying, our gravel shoulder width varying, depending on what those alignments are doing. I'm going to close out of this. So why do we assign targets on the other side? Um, you know, there's, there's some different thoughts on this. I'm going to point out two different ways. I, pr I prefer this, which is to define regions that can be then copied to other portions of the project that have pretty much the same definition. Okay? I don't mean the exact same definition. The widths of things, the slopes of things could be varied, but they're the same definition that they have a lane, they have a second lane, they have a shoulder, right? Um, the definition in this middle region is no shoulder on the side. That has to be an entirely different assembly. But what I'm saying here is that we're going to use the same assembly for both regions. And if you assign all those targets to one region, I can then run this command, copy region, pick on this, select this region, that's the source, and then a copy, what is my station limit for the new region? We're going to go from right there to somewhere down there. Okay, all those targets are in place, and even though the target down here is assigned to this region as well, it doesn't hurt anything. Think of it. Think of it as a region definition that you can copy to all the different places in your corridor that have, have the same definition. Now, what are the what are the disadvantages of this? Well, you can't just name this assembly a certain station range. It's going to be used in a number of different areas. You have to keep track of that. So you might change this thinking, well, it's just affecting this one area. But no, it's affecting two areas. So it's simpler in that we can have less assemblies, more complicated, in that um, we have to be aware of which regions are, are being used or, or which ones use that assembly. So I prefer this, uh, but I've been working in Civil 3D for 10 years, so you know, I'm fairly used to it. What about this middle piece here? Okay, As I said, it's basically this whole section, but nothing in south. So this is fairly simple. I can come in here, I can do a window select on this whole thing, do a control C and a control V, and paste this up here. And then on my right side, I can delete both that 100th width lane and also the shoulder in the daylight. Okay, I'll pick on this assembly and I'll rename this. We'll call it 8-INT for intersection. Okay. Naming this stuff is very important. There's, there's nice WIST standards to keep track of this so it, it makes sense from one user to the next. I encourage you guys to really use that, that those naming conventions. So this region is fairly straightforward. Again, picking on the quarter using this contextual ribbon. It's new to 2014. It's really handy. I've got add regions up here. I can pick on add regions, prompts me for a station range. I'm going to go from right here to right up there. So very interactive. And then my assembly will be the 8 intersection. I have one target to assign here. That's my existing one. Hit OK. And OK again. That region is done. Okay. Next region, let's look at the side road here. Uh, this is basically the same kind of road section, a little simpler, it's a little narrower, doesn't have the whole paved shoulder, but all the targets I'm going to assign are much like the ones I assigned uh, down here. So let's do that then. Again, a window select. Control C and Control V, and we're going to put this over here in a new stack because this is a different road. So let's pick on this one. Let's rename this assembly what it is. 
it's Westwood. Okay. And this one doesn't have any of the fancy little lane tricks, the little hundredth width. We don't need any of that. We don't have turn lanes opening up. So I'll delete that out of there. And we just have a fairly basic assembly in there. Let's go ahead and build that, um, that region. Now this is a different baseline, of course. Pick on the corridor. I have add baseline. Just about everything you need is up here. Add baseline. It's going to be the local Westwood Avenue alignment. And for the profile, it's going to be Westwood propo uh, proposed. I can now leave that corridor selected. Select add region. It prompts me to select a baseline. I have two of them now. I'm going to pick my Westwood one. Then the station range is from right there. And we're only going up until the section changes. The section changes right here. So we're only going to go to right there. The assembly will be that Westwood assembly we just made a copy of. And the targeting is very, very uh, quite similar here, too. We've got existing ground. That's our surface targets. We have our left lane. That's the lane generic we'll pick in there. This will be this edge of pavement right here, that alignment. Add that. And then we have the right lane right over here, lane generic right. Okay. We don't have a paved shoulder. We have a gravel shoulder. So we're going to set this total top shoulder width on the right side. That will be this alignment. Add it to the list. And then on the left side, that will be this one here. Okay. Add it to the list. I'm going through that target selection pretty quickly. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time there. I want you guys to understand the concepts of the targeting and what I'm doing. Not necessarily all the picks and clicks. You can open the data set. We can look at the video for that kind of thing. Let's make sure we understand this workflow and the concepts. I'll hit OK. And that comes in there pretty close, not quite what we want. And what is it? I see my edge of pavement. That's right there. It's a little tough with a lot of lines going on, but it's right there. And here's my edge of gravel shoulder. I have a paved shoulder in here as well. Okay. I need to go in there and pick the shoulders for my Westwood assembly, pick both of those sub-assemblies at the same time, and then I can go to properties and I can set that paved shoulder width to 0.01 to nearly zero it out. Okay. If I rebuild this corridor now, I pick on it, so I have rebuild corridor up here, and I'll see that shoulder disappear. What about this piece in here? On one side we have curb and it's curving. That's going to be handled in one region. This little piece right here is going to be handled by a half assembly, a little half, um, half road piece. So I'm going to make a copy of Westwood, do a control C and a control V and put it right on top. And the only difference here is that the whole left side is gone. Okay? It's just the right side. So the assignment here will be much like before pick on the corridor, add regions. So this is very repeatable workflow. Once you've made your corridor, you pick on it, add regions, edit frequency, edit targets, all these sorts of things. Add regions. We're going to go along this baseline. I'm going to go from right there. It's kind of a handy. You don't even need to snap right there. If I just bring my cursor right up to it, it's going to see that other region, basically, and know to go right up against it. Go from right there, and an endpoint snap right there. It's going to be, uh, I forgot to rename that, it's Westwood 3, that's the half road assembly. And very similar targets here, the existing ground for my ditch. And then I have the lane on the right side. That's going to target this pavement piece right here. Add that. And my total, total top shoulder width. Pick on that one and select my gravel shoulder edge. Okay. 
It's pretty quick, right? We can model a whole intersection in 40 minutes. No. I know I glossed over it. We're focusing on the modeling again. Um, obviously, I took some time to draw those alignments. All that's part of it, right? Um, so once that stuff's in place, though, corridors should come together pretty quickly. Hit OK and Enter. And there's that small piece there. OK, we're getting there. We're almost there. These two curb returns, these are going to be handled with a separate assembly, a separate baseline, and a separate region. They're going to be modeled along these alignments. And this is pretty similar to what the intersection wizard does. So the assembly we're going to use, I don't want to take too much time building it, but it's got a lane piece. It has a curve behind it. I drop my scale down a little bit. There's a curve behind it. And a similar uh, simple ditch here. Um, I don't believe it was in the 2012 uh, setup, but I know in 14 they put some more code set styles in here that call out the codes that are in your assemblies. It's real handy to assign this to your assembly. So if I pick on this assembly, go to assembly properties, right here in the codes I have point and link codes, that type of code set style assigned. That allows me to see all the codes at play here. It's these codes that I use to do what? I build my surface out of them um, and a number of other things. So we know what pieces are in our assembly. <clears throat> so that's the, the assembly we're going to use. What about the profile for this alignment? We haven't defined that yet. Okay. So I'm going to create a surface profile along existing, and I'm also going to do it along the corridor surface. So this is a nice little trick. First thing we have to do is we have to build our corridor surface. So if I go to corridor surfaces in my right click menu, I can click add a surface. That'll be proposed. And I can add my feature lines to it. I'll get most of them here. Crown, edge of travel way. Okay. I get ETW. Okay. So some standard practices for building a surface here. And hit OK. And my surface is built. Okay. Now I just left it on left it on a border style. Okay. Now here's a little trick. What does the profile look like along this this alignment? Well, it's the elevation right there, and it's the elevation right there of those two regions, right? Okay. I can't really see my regions in a profile view, but what I can do is cut a surface profile of this surface and I'll be able to snap to and see those exact elevations. In order to see those and snap to it, I've drawn my alignment to have one foot little extensions here so they hang into basically those adjacent regions. So what does this look like? We pick on the assembly We've got surface profile up here. I'm going to add both the Westwood surface proposed and the existing. Okay. Westwood proposed, I'll set that to a different style. I'll just pick basic. And I'm going to click draw on profile view. So fairly typical workflow for generating surface profiles. I'm going to click next through most of this. I'm going to verify that I have labels turned off here. No labels. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to drop this profile view right here. So what do I have in here? Okay. In this profile view style, I turned it on for this presentation. I have horizontal geometry points turned on. So right in my profile view style, I've turned on uh, somewhere in here. Horizontal geometry points. I don't want to spend too much time in there. I turned it on. These right here represent the ends of the curves, or the PCs and the PTs on that curve return. Okay. Right there is where I need to snap to to draw in my proposed profile for my curve return. Okay. This right here, that's my proposed surface. It looks kind of looks like junk right now, 
because I haven't modeled or controlled any of it right here. It's just triangulating straight across there. You'll see this more clearly if I change the surface style of this surface. Not existing, we'll do proposed, hit OK. Right, so it's just triangulating across there. I didn't put any kind of boundary on it. Okay, so I need to draw a profile for this. So pick on the profile view. I've got profile creation tools. This will be the alignment name dash proposed. Profile style will be lane edge. And I'll hit OK. Now I'm just going to draw on a straight grade for right now. So draw tangents. We're going to go from that point right there to that point right there. Okay. So again, that little piece, that's that one foot extension that I showed you right up here. That's that one foot extension. We do that again so we can get that little piece right there to show up. We have something to snap to. Okay, I have that profile. The assembly I'm going to be using is that one right there. Let's go ahead and build this region. Uh, but first we need the assembly. So I'm going to pick this corridor, go to Add Baseline, and the baseline will be Curb Return 8 Westwood, Southeast. And that profile, that's the one I just drew, that very simple constant grade. Keep the corridor selected, select Add Region, and we're going to pick this baseline. Very interactive. Now here's the trick. We don't go the full length of the alignment. That would be overlapping the previous region, right? We go from right there, adjacent to that region, to right there. The assembly will be the Westwood curve return. We'll hit OK. Initially, I'm going to cancel out of the, the target mapping. So there's that basic assembly along that edge there. Okay. I want to talk about targets with this. How do we handle the targets? Okay. Well, curb returns, you kind of model from the edge of the road in, right? So instead of going from the center line, then you target something that represents the edge of road or edge of shoulder or something like that. We instead go from the edge and then we target in. So we're going to target this center line alignment and we're also going to target, I send my corridor to the back, this alignment right here. So what is this alignment? This is an offset alignment in this drawing. Okay? And we haven't used it until right now. And here's where we use setup corridors. What, is, what does the elevation look like through here? Well, it depends on the super elevation, right? So what I have in here, if I go ahead and turn on a layer, I'm going to show you briefly. I have a very simple corridor defined in here. And this corridor is using just a very basic assembly right here with two lanes. Now the width of these lanes is 14 feet. It goes beyond the edge of travel lane. Okay, so basic corridor. We make that corridor and then we make a surface out of it as well. A very simple surface. This corridor is following the super elevation as well, right? So it's tilting as we go through this curve. I can then take these, pro these alignments and I can cut a surface profile of that surface I just made. That will give me a profile that I can target from my curb return. Okay? This is the point of a setup corridor. It's to define surface profiles that are basically linked to the center line that you can then target for a number of scenarios. One of the most common is, is an intersection like this. If you don't do this, you don't have a dynamic link to centerline elevations, or you're making two separate corridors, or some other way that's fairly tedious. Okay. So what I had done is I took that alignment, and I made a surface profile of it. There it is, right there. That's setup profile. Let's cancel out of here. Let's come back to this drawing, and let's look at the targeting. Click on this guy. Go to edit, edit targets pick that region. Targets are going to be existing ground and then the width target for the lane that's going to be two things, right? It's going to be the center line of Westwood and it's also going to be the edge of the travelway 
of Highway 8. I also need to do the same thing to control slope, right? Because the slope of this lane through that curb return is varying, right? It's, it kind of, it's, a, it's kind of fudging as it goes around there. So I need to set the Highway 8 right offset. I need to grab that surface profile. This is the profile that's cut from the setup corridor. Okay, and I add that to the list. I also need to grab Westwood and the proposed profile there. So multiple targets. Hit OK. Hit OK again, and now it matches into those edges. Okay. I also need to edit my frequency. This is not enough detail for a curb return. So frequency is important. Click on the corridor, go to Edit Frequency. Click on that guy. And on curves, we'll say 5 feet. Hit OK. Just about there, we do want it to tuck in and basically tie in right to that corner there. So we'll pick on Edit Frequency one more time and go and edit this region. And we want to add a manual station down here. An endpoint snap. Actually, I believe I have to do an apparent intersect snap. Yep, right there. So I click that, it grabs that station, and now it ties right into that corner. Okay. The other end is pretty much the same, and I'm not going to take the time to go through it. I'll point out one other little thing, though. When you define that, the frequency and the targets are the same for that region, right? Exact same targets, exact same frequency. All you have to do is set up the baseline in the region and then use this right here. Here's your, here's your power button, your easy button. Match parameters. That will match all the targets and the frequency of one region to those of another. We're going a little short on time. I don't have time to show that, uh, but I wanted to, um, to point that out. Let me grab a drawing, jump uh, just forward to the end here, that last region. Okay. That's just doing what I had talked about. And then the one last step I had done in there was I went to my boundaries and I had corridor extents as outer boundary. Okay. This is an option that's there all the time in 2014. For a number of reasons, it wasn't there in 2012 because it only happened with the intersection wizard. It's there now. They fixed it. So a couple other items I want to mention, just kind of in conclusion then. When you're modeling intersections like this, it, there's kind of a, a frame of mind even, uh, you could say, to it. Um, don't think of drafting plan sheets. You have to be thinking in terms of modeling your project. We're modeling the roadway. We're not drafting a plan sheet. Okay. What that sometimes means is it takes more time. But what do you get out of that? You get a surface that's made pre-automatically. You get sections that are, are in, in great detail. Um, it's, it's a different mind, mindset, but it, it's worth doing it. It's, it's part of the whole BIM concept that um, Civil 3D and other types of applications in roads um, are part of. Um, plan out and minimize your corridor region. So I talked about that a little bit, right? We use one assembly for both sides. Now, even if you use two assemblies, one for each side, minimize it and do things like the 100th width lane sub-assembly so that you don't have to make one for the turn lane and one for the typical section. Okay, Plan it out. Make slightly more complex assemblies, more targets in your regions, so that you can make a simpler corridor, fewer regions. And keep things organized with file separation and naming conventions. I had three separate drawings here. That's a minimum for that type of data. Okay, Very likely, if it was a larger project, you may need multiple corridor drawings. Uh, and that's just, a lot of that comes down to performance. Um, and use those naming conventions. You know, someone else jumps into your drawing, they need to understand what's going on. You come back to it after some time, a long vacation. You know, what did I do here? I had probably 20 different alignments in there. I've named them a way that makes sense. Okay. And be precise with your drafting geometry. This really makes a difference to get your corridors to behave properly. One example was that, that curb return. The way I drew this alignment, I made sure that that curve coming in here 
came in exactly tangent, exactly parallel to the center line. If that wasn't exactly parallel, then I would have overlapping regions. My surface wouldn't build correctly. Okay. So be precise with your drafting, drawing of that geometry. And build a dynamic corridor. I always strive to do this. That's the setup corridor. We did that because what? What if my center line profile changes? Okay. Then that setup surface goes up or down with it, right? Then those edge of travelway surface profiles go up and down with it. And so do my curve return regions. They will always tie into that edge. You can't get much more dynamic than that. And the point of doing it is not because it's cool. I mean, it is fun, but the point of it is so that you can respond to the changes that inevitably will come at the 11th hour, right? So um, just kind of some, some conclusions there to think about. Um, with that, uh, thanks a lot for watching. Um, at this point, we're going to go to uh, local Q&A sessions. Um, if anyone has any questions about the presentation I did today, I'm, I'm glad to, to answer any questions. Feel free to email me. Feel free to call me. Uh, I'm glad to address any questions. I know we went through quite a bit in 40 minutes, but I, I really wanted to expose you guys to it. Um, for those of you who haven't seen some strategies like that, and then allow you to look at the data set and kind of work from there afterwards. So thanks again. Have a good day.